morning, everybody. Dear distinguished panelists, dear guests in the audience, dear Fazila. On behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, I would like to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion on perspectives on building an inclusive South African economy. Again, SACSIS, supported by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, organized a public discussion on a very important and current issue. I'm very glad that so many of you followed our invitation. Since this discussion will be recorded and put up on the internet, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank our audience out there in the World Wide Web for listening and watching and being interested on the issues we are raising. My name is Renate Tembusch and I'm the director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung here in South Africa. This is the fifth and the last panel discussion that we are organizing together with SACSIS for this year. Hence, this event today will conclude a circle of interesting conversations we had in 2014. When I asked Fazila whether she wanted me to raise something in particular in my introduction, she reminded me that we Germans are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall tomorrow. So maybe it would be interesting to share some thoughts on how the Germans managed the special reunification challenges and became the strongest economy, economy in Europe. And even more important, to be able to offer all people living in Germany, which now almost doubled in size geographically as well as in terms of population, a good standard of living. Although I agree that it is always useful to learn from lessons of successful economies that are able to deliver a good standard of living to their citizens, Germany, for example, always looked at how the Scandinavian countries were doing so well on being wealthy, and at the same time, sorry, more equal and inclusive societies than all the rest in the world. Yet I think you all would agree that it is always, always difficult to compare two countries that are not only located on different continents, but also are coming from a totally different history, like this is the case with South Africa and Germany. However, maybe there are still some lessons to learn from the challenges faced by Germany over the last 25 years and how they are being resolved. And let me, let me make this clear, this is still work in progress. Even after 25 years, not everybody in Germany, in particular not our brothers and sisters from the former Eastern provinces, or the many immigrants living since generations among us, would agree that we are an equal and inclusive society. In particular not when it comes to economic issues. And if you look at the facts, it's true. Still the wages and the government pensions in the former East Germany are lower than in the Western parts. In the private sector as well as in the public sector. Still, the industrial sector on the eastern side has not recovered. In particular, the huge shipyards, the big textile and steel and chemical companies were all closed down. Many people, not only the, the low-skilled, lost their jobs. Consequently, also the unemployment rate is still higher in the eastern parts of our country. Even in the capital Berlin, you will find the economic divide still runs along the not anymore existing physical border. And along with the economic challenges are coming the social challenges. In particular, a group of young unemployed males seeing no future perspe perspective tend to xenophobia, which comes in Germany with the ugly face of right-wing nazism. Demographically, we are an aging society and poverty among the elderly is a huge problem. And like everywhere in the world, in particular, women are affected. On the other hand, if you look at the infrastructure, you find that in the eastern parts, cities like Leipzig, Dresden, among others, have a very sophisticated and modern infrastructure, much better than in many cities in, uh, in West Germany, where in particular the middle-sized and the small cities are struggling with the neglect of public infrastructure. This is partly due to the fact that for, for years, millions of euros were transferred to the eastern parts, rightfully. Partly the money comes from the German taxpayers, the so-called Soli Zuschlag, we call it in Germany, and partly it comes from the EU. Also due to tax incentives and other government subsidies, important service, service sector companies, in particular the IT sector, boomed in some regions of eastern Germany. And many new jobs in that sector were created. 
The former Chancellor Kohl promised blühende Landschaft, and that means blooming landscapes, and he promised that they would come very soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall. This didn't happen so fast, but you can find a lot of patches where we certainly do have blühende Landschaften. All in all, from an outside perspective, it looks as if Germany managed to create an inclusive society. Our unemployment rate reached a low level of 4.9%. Our economy is still growing while all the other European countries, in particular the South European countries, are suffering. But although our unemployment rates are low, many people working in a full-time job can't afford a decent life due to the fact that their salaries are not sufficient. Decent living means not only to be able to bring food on the table and to have a roof over your head. Decent living means all basic needs are catered for and you are able to engage in social, social life, as well as social mobility is guaranteed. But many people in Germany, in particular families with more than two kids, single parents and immigrants, have to work in two to three jobs in order to earn enough to make a decent living. Therefore, government with the support of the trade unions and civil society introduced a national minimum wage coming into effect in 2015. And I know this debate is also happening right here. Yes, we do have a comprehensive social security system in place that guarantees that nobody in Germany has to live in dire poverty. But the gap between the wealthy and the poorer is widening like everywhere in the world. What is still different in Germany, also in comparison to most of our neighbor countries, is that we still do have a stable middle class, which is supported by a broad and healthy middle and small size economy sector that provides jobs. On top of it, we are not an anglophone type shareholder economy. We still have a lot of companies that are privately owned and are not registered at the stock market. Our economy is supported by a tradition of entrepreneurship, high developed engineering skills, a robust research sector, and still a high standard education and vocational training system. And last but not least, we do have strong trade, union, trade unions and a functioning social dialogue that is based on co-determination, as well as a strong civil society. These are definitely the major advantages that also help Germany to get better through the global economic crisis so far than most of our neighbors. However, unfortunately, there are signs of a turnaround. The Investor Confidence Index and the BIP forecast are indicating a slowdown in our economy, not least due to neglect of public investment by the government. But the finance minister is still focusing on bringing down our debt level to zero rather than spending money on an urgently needed uplift of our infrastructure. There is a strong feeling that government has to change its position on fiscal stability and to start investing in particular in our educational system and in our transport system. Conclusion. Our economy is more inclusive and equal than maybe the economies of many other countries. But we are far from perfect, and we did some things right, but we still have huge chunks in our society that are excluded. Immigrants, elderly people, and a lot of not well-skilled young men in particular. So, if there are some lessons to learn from Germany, I would suggest one of it is, it is important to have a social compact where despite all the difficulties and different interests you find in each society, at the end of the day, and in particular in the face of a social and economic crisis, there is enough confidence among the different stakeholders, including government, the economic sector, trade unions and civil society. This confidence is not coming out of the blue. It is hard work to achieve and hard work to keep. And only if all the different partners are equally independent and strong, and the common goal is clear, it will work out. And economic, economic inclusiveness is one of the most important goals for a successful society. Having sec said this, uh, thanks for your patience. And um, I'm looking forward now to hear an interesting debate on the South African case. And uh, I want to thank Fasilla once again, and her team for organizing this debate and all the other debates we had last year. And I also would like to thank, uh, to take this opportunity, to thank my colleague Camilla Josef, who supported us so well during the last year with all these uh, organization of these uh, events. So, 
having said this, thanks to all of you again. Thanks to the panel. And yeah, I'll take please take over, Fazil. Thank you, Renata. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have you all here today. And welcome especially to the panel for making the time to come and speak to us this morning. I'm very excited that we're having this conversation um, about the economy and that we're, we've been able to bring together people with a wide range of perspectives. You know, as Bill Clinton famously said, it's the economy, stupid. But unfortunately, what happened in South Africa when we negotiated our transition to democracy is that the economy was left out of those negotiations. Well, 20 years <coughs> later, we are indeed paying the price for that oversight. One need just look around to see that the impact of the legacy of apartheid still affects black South Africans greatly, um, many of whom are still mired in poverty. Also in South Africa, we can't actually have a conversation about poverty without talking about race and inequality. Unfortunately, we haven't as yet put ourselves on a trajectory that's going to change or close that gap in any way. And the, the biggest problem seems to be that, you know, we have economic experts who talk about these issues but who are blinded by ideological dogma. Um, nobody seems to be willing to shift from their position and move closer towards people who hold a different perspective. And, you know, when we do get together, we tend to talk past each other. And I think it's time for us to move beyond that. Hence, bringing together this panel of views across the spectrum so that we can have a healthy debate about how to move forward and move ourselves a little bit out of our usual comfort zones. There have been calls for an economic codessa in South Africa. It's far beyond the role of Saxis and FES <laughs> to organize something like that. But we're hoping that today's conversation is going to be a, a small contribution towards bringing people together to have a shared conversation about what it would mean to have a common vision for building an ex inclusive economy that will deliver for all South Africans, not just a few. You would have noticed if, um, in the invitation that we released to people to attend this event, whether you got it on email or saw it on the, on the website, you would have noticed that we're not asking any new questions. We're asking the age-old questions, and that's because these issues remain unresolved. So questions like, what kind of jobs should we be creating? How do we create jobs? Um, how do we build an economy that's going to address South Africa's inequality and distribute wealth more equitably? And uh, a question that I sent to the panelists when I was talking to them in the run-up to the event was, you know, what role do they see for the different stakeholders in society in contributing to building a more inclusive um, economy? These are age-old questions. They have evaded co uh, consensus so far. So what I'm looking for from my panelists this morning is some fresh thinking on these old questions, because really we do need to move forward and not backwards. Having said that, let me introduce you to uh, this wonderful panel that we've put together. You'll notice some small changes. Let me just deal with the changes first before I introduce everybody on the panel. Um, we have a replacement for Leon Lowe at the Free Market Foundation who was called away at the last minute to deal with the legal matter. So we have Vivian Atud who's standing in for Leon Lowe from the Free Market Foundation. Vivian's a researcher at the foundation and she's reading for a PhD in economics. So she's very well qualified to take his place on the panel this morning. I feel very privileged to have Anne Bernstein on our panel this morning. She's from the Center for Development and Enterprise. Anne is a public intellectual. Um, she leads one of the most foremost thin think tanks in the country, which she founded, and she's an absolute stalwart in the sector that's been dealing with economic development in South Africa. I'm also very happy to have with us a rising media star <laughs> this morning, Trudy Makaya, who is a former commissioner at the Competition Commission in South Africa, who is now working at uh, E! News Channel Africa as an economics analyst. We're very pleased to have Trudy with us this morning. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to Salim Fakir. Salim is a regular columnist at Saxis, but 
his most important job, or more important job, is he's the, the head of the Living Planet Unit at the World Wildlife Fund. And he specializes in sustainable energy issues. But from Saxus's perspective, Salim has been writing quite a lot about the economy. And so we're very happy having him here this morning to offer an alternative perspective on that. OK, so I am going to hand over to Trudy, who has graciously agreed to open the discussions this morning. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you to Saxes and FES uh, for hosting this dialogue. I think it's very important to have different perspectives um, in one platform to talk, you know, to have um, everyone representing views um, across the whole um, range um, of opinions in our society. Um, in preparation for this discussion, one of the things I actually read was not an economic text, um, uh, strictly speaking, uh, but an essay written by an Indian environmental historian um, called uh, Ramachandra Guha. And it's about the center, which I absolutely believe has to hold. Um, because I'd like to think I'm in the center, that I'm a moderate, and that I, uh, I understand um, you know, the economy from multiple perspectives. And he talks about how the writer should seek to make each side see the truth in the other, which I think all of us accept. Uh, we think our writers, be they creative writers, um, or even in, in the nonfiction space, to be objective and to also extend our perspectives um, so that they don't just re uh, reaffirm what we already believe. Now, I think this is even more important um, for analysts and economists. And it is a pity that we do have a debate that's often um, very rooted in people's ideological views uh, without that ability to enable an audience to see the other side and to see that there might actually be some truth um, in, in, in the other perspective. I think today it's a, very, it's a bit of a gloomy Friday. Um, we started. Um, uh, this morning, knowing that yesterday we had another ratings downgrade uh, from Moody's this time of um, sovereign debt. And I think we're an economy and a new cycle and a society that kind of feeds on this short-term information, like, oh, another downgrade. Um, things are going downhill. Panic, panic. What's the quick solution? But of course, really, the answer is thinking about the long-term um, perspective and saying, where do we really want to be? and to make the um, trade-offs um, that we need um, to get there. Now, we've had a very difficult history um, in terms of uh, economic history over the past 20 years. There have been some successes, um, of course. I think we shouldn't uh, be down on ourselves. But this is an economy that makes the case very much um, for inclusive growth. Because when the post-apartheid settlement happened, I mean, I do think there was some um, analysis and thinking around the economy, but it was quite naive in, in many respects. And it fed into a time when um, the so-called Washington Consensus was the standard for thinking about how to develop an emerging market economy. And, as, and as, so I think we fell into that discussion and adopted what we thought uh, was best practice um, at the time. Now, even advocates of the Washington Consensus in terms of policies that seek liberalization, privatization, uh, fairly free labor markets, etc., would argue that the way that um, certain governments characterized that consensus was rather simplistic. It was not as if there was ever a time uh, when institutions like the World Bank or the IMF really um, thought that there's no role for social spending in society um, or that social protection is not an important issue. Of course, they prioritized um, other goals. But they would argue that um, they, they always had a, a far more nuanced um, advice to emerging market um, governments than the governments heard. I think in our case, for instance, we liberalized our economy quite rapidly. And sometimes it's often said beyond what was required or what would have been required uh, in terms of our international obligations at the time. Now, I think everyone from, from learning from that experience globally has come to the point that, yes, growth is very important, but there are different qualities, uh, or, or growth is not, and it comes in different varieties. Um, there's low quality growth, there's high quality growth, there's inclusive growth, um, there's jobless growth. And so um, even the World Bank itself makes a big deal about 
um, inclusive growth and the policies that ensure that whilst you're developing your economy, you're also not undermining your society and creating problems that, that will t in turn reverse that very growth um, that you're trying to achieve. Now, South Africa, of course, doesn't do well for obvious reasons in measures like opportunity. Um, if you look at the uh, opportunity index, it still says that 20 years down the line, someone's opportunity is still, or someone's um, outcomes in life are still determined by geography, by gender, by race. Um, that was once again the World Bank. But even um, our own statistics, you look at um, a recent report by, the South, by Stats SA, which looked at youth unemployment, and shockingly it found that in the 20 years um, of democracy, the level of skills acquisition by black South Africans had actually um, deteriorated while other groups have advanced. Now, before we get to discussing about who we blame for that, it does simply create the context to say that clearly, opportunities to advance um, the next generation, to avoid another lost generation, were simply lost in the first 20 years, and we can't go on like that. Um, as was mentioned in my past life, I, I was um, Deputy Commissioner at the Competition Commission. And I think once again, the work of the, the, the competition authorities highlights the way in which ours is still not an inclusive society. Um, you know, there's a whole stream um, of evidence showing different practices by companies that are incumbent established companies that raise the barriers to entry for new and emerging um, entrants into the economy um, to be able to thrive. So all in all, we're not doing very well in terms of including young people in our development. We're not doing very well in terms of including entrepreneurs or small business players um, in the economy. It is what we, we've come to understand as a very closed system uh, that needs to get out of the state of paralysis and to move forward having learned from the lessons um, of the earlier years. Now, I think we haven't quite cracked the policy mix that we need uh, for inclusive growth. We talk about the National Development Plan, you know, um, ad nauseum. Even the, the rating agency that downgraded us this week itself kept referring to the National Development Plan as, to, um, as the, the solution um, to get us from where we are at the moment to where we need to be. Now, having focused more on the economy chapters of the National Development Plan, I'd say it is a fairly good starting point um, in terms of thinking about policy and a framework um, for going forward. It's obviously not perfect, it has its flaws, but it's also not so detailed as to curtail um, further debate um, and further development of concrete policies um, in terms of people who do have serious um, uh, problems uh, with it. Now, the issue with the National Development Plan is that it also, like what we've had over the past 20 years, has different strands of policy. It's got public sector reform, higher education reform, um, employment generation, energy policy, you know, the whole um, range um, of policies that address various aspects of society. What we don't know um, as yet, and what we haven't achieved as yet, is the right policy mix to ensure that the economy does grow at over 5%, perhaps even as the Reserve Bank famously wrote that paper at 8% uh, growth rates. We need that, yet at the same time ensuring that we don't exacerbate um, some of the social ills um, that we have. And I think part of the problem is that we do look to one solution um, and become frustrated when that doesn't work. So for instance, competition policy in of itself, it's achieved a lot. You know, if most people would know about the bread cartel having um, been uh, disbanded, the construction cartel. Um, most, um, a lot of state monopolies like South African Airways or former state monopolies um, like Cecil have come um, under the eye of the, of the authorities. Uh, Telcom famously, um, you know, entered into a settlement close to two billion rands for its contraventions of competition uh, policy. So you, you have um, very significant developments that have meant that the economy should be opening up to more competition, but is it really? And that's where you get to see the limits of just that one uh, policy approach, because of course competition policy can't create jobs directly. Um, it hasn't able to, it, it can't create entrepreneurs in the sense that it can create a level playing field, but if financing mechanisms are not in place, uh, or, or if skills um, development is not what it should be, then you're not going to have um, um, those entrepreneurs coming forward. 
The same with fiscal policy. For years and years and years, we did have um, fairly expensive fiscal policy where governments spend more um, on the poor, spend a lot of money in education and in health, and reduced inequality to some extent if you take into account um, those um, expenditures. And yet, amongst our peer group and probably globally, we are still the most um, unequal society um, in the world. And you can go through the same um, kind of exercise with various uh, policies. And what you see is that you, you often hit the limit of what that one policy can achieve. And you also realize that it's not well coordinated uh, with other policies that could have been um, supportive or that could have ensured that we get the maximum benefits uh, from our successes. So in a sense, we have a very lopsided approach um, to policy and also a very lopsided approach um, to our policy discussions. Now, interestingly, we had a labor relations um, in Daba um, quite recently. I didn't attend that, but from the um, reports that emerged, it was very clear that once again, we're still in a paradigm where business says we want flexible um, labor markets. Uh, we're not very happy about the minimum wage. The unions want the minimum wage. Civil society is kind of caught somewhere in between, and government um, then has to find a path out of all of this. And I think what the problem, part of the problem is that people don't necessarily bring their sacrifices to the table. I think you ask the questions about what can different sectors of society bring um, to a discussion um, or to, to resolving the impasse that we seem to be. And we are still stuck in, in, in a, a system where people talk about their demands and what they would like to see without necessarily understanding that there have to be trade-offs and they have to make credible sacrifices um, that they bring to the table that will enable us to move forward. So I go back to the National Development Plan. I've witnessed panels where there have been vociferous um, opposition um, to the plan uh, from um, Kosatu, for instance. And the question I often ask myself is, well, yes, there are problematic aspects to it, but perhaps the areas that, that you know, a labor movement would find problematic are probably areas that would be um, things to sacrifice for the greater good. So for instance, the idea of revisiting um, bargaining mechanisms. Uh, you know, in terms of the labor relations strife that we've had in, in recent times, there is no way we can pretend that our regime is working well. And therefore, that should be open for debate and discussion. You look at business, the same um, dynamic plays out. There's complete um, you know, disavowal of the possibility um, of a minimum wage. And yet, if you think about it, that would be a good thing to give up if there were commitments from government in terms of uh, productivity, enhancements, and also social spending. And so I think this fixation over, I want this, I want that, and if I don't get that, I'm not going to sign up for the NDP, or I'm not going to support social programs, um, lends us in, in, into this kind of difficulty. And of course, we are a democracy. We can't have a benevolent dictator impose um, solutions on us. We have to move forward. Um, through constructive dialogue, which I must admit is sorely um, lacking in the South African case. You know, when you, you see it also when um, in indicators such as the World Economic Forum Index comes out, um, which paints a picture, of course, of um, effective um, corporate governance and effectiveness of corporate boards. I mean, I don't know if they'll say this next year, but certainly this year um, that was the case and very poor um, human capital indicators on health, uh, on education. Of course, there are problems with the methodology, but I think that's a general sense um, that we have, that the private sector is exceptional, it has risen above the challenges of the society, whereas government is, is pulling us back. Which is also the wrong way, the wrong paradigm to think about it, because you can't have labor relations strive as a labor problem or as a government problem. You know labor is relating um, to someone who's also equally responsible for the mess that we're in. Um, you, you can't have a human capital meltdown that we seem to be having in, in our public services without seeing it as a national problem and not a government problem. And difficult as the conversation might be without seeing it as something that the private sector should and, and, and should insist um, on contributing to um, addressing and should insist on holding government accountable. So I think all in all, I think I'm in the center. Um, I see problems and I see also truths in, in both um, um, sides of the spectrum. 
And I think once we're able to get the best ideas coming out and implementing them and swallowing the sacrifices for what they are, uh, because they will hurt, there'll be problems, but can enable us to move forward, I think only then will we have a really um, constructive debate. But yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what the rest of the panel members have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trudy. I mean, I think you're right to say that we need the right policy mix, at least as well. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Vivian to make her input. Please, Vivian. Okay. Um, thank you very much. The whole topic of transformation and inclusive economy, it, it's something that is very, very close to my heart because um, a few years back when I was still with the foundation, I was busy doing research on ownership, for example, on, on the JSC. And we went through the share registers from 2000, I mean, from the year 2000 till then, it was 2011, and looking at ownership, direct ownership, indirect ownership. And we did that kind of a study for like three years. And what was coming out when the JSC was releasing the study was, we found out that when you look at direct ownership, people owning stocks in their names, black South Africans consistently owned for the period we did the research between 7%. Um, that's minus, you've, we've not really calculated debts and all that, and between 7 and 9% in, in, in that range. And you ask yourself, where are we heading to? What kind of an economy do we want to leave for our children and their children? And those kind of questions, and when you move out into society like we've already seen, you hear unemployment and the majority of the unemployed being youth and blacks, and you ask yourself, within the BRICS forum that we are now, we have a luxury of having a youthful population but at this point in time, their skills, their aspirations, their talents are not being fully utilized. And unlike the German case and other European and North American countries that have advanced and their population is aging, and they made use, they, they made use of their youthful population when the time was right, we're missing that gap. And it's, it's worrying because we are at a point where 20 years into democracy, we are asking ourselves, we moved from 96, 95 from RDP, we moved to GIA, we moved at Skisa, we moved to all kinds of policy, and now we have the NDP. So I think as a country, South Africa is not short of policies. In fact, we have an oversupply of, of, of policy. So when we, when we move from that standpoint that we have these creative and nice initiatives coming up from government and, and, and stakeholders, what is the issue with us from a policy point of view? Like the, my fellow panelists already said there, what is the composition, the mix of this policy? How do we adjust this policy to speak to the aspirations? Because sometimes in doing policy, like she said, there is this pool. Stakeholders want their interest. I think it is time as a country we ask whose interest is most important if we need to move forward the agenda of transformation when it comes to policy drafting. Is it the aspirations of the population, the poorest of the poor, or the aspirations of big business, the aspirations of politicians, the aspirations of trade unions, whose aspirations should be prioritized? if we really want to build an inclusive society. And I think it's a question that each and every one of us, in, including other stakeholders, need to start looking at critically <coughs> because until we address that and know whose aspiration, and in my mind, I would say the aspirations, a country that is looking forward, we should be able to look at the needs, the priorities of the unemployed, the poorest of the poor, how do we get children back to school? How do we get the majority of the unemployed that are mostly blacks? Which policy works? She already talked about things like education. It's when we look at our education spend, for example, it's the highest in Africa. 
and you ask yourself, education outcomes were almost the worst. And you ask yourself, what is, what is missing in between? Surely someone should be held accountable if we come up with great budget reallocations. It's our money. Government has no money. As an economist, I know government has no money. The only money government has is the one that we as taxpayers give or it borrows. It either collects from us or it borrows. And uh, so we should, as a civil society, as individuals, hold the government accountable for our hard-earned money because when we pay taxes, and surely for the interest of the education of the poor, this money should be allocated because without education, which is key, the right education, because we've had discussions in, in, in recent years of having metrics that can't read or write, and, and that should be wrong. We can't pass people through a school system just for passing sake, and the jobs market, there is what we call the demand and supply mismatch of, of labor. You come to an economy where the majority of the unemployed are blacks and youth, and these guys get into the job market with the wrong skills. And why? Because we are still talking past each other. We need to be more collaborative in terms of the supply and the demand for labor. The need when we, people in education, are, are, are training our young people, we should be training people in skills that are needed by, 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 by the job market. Because when you look at HRs and all the jobs that they are looking for employees all the time, and yet we have people looking for jobs all the time. And so those are some of the little things that we need to critically look at if we are going to have an inclusive e economy. So when we look at policy, there, she already talked about fiscal and monetary policies. I mean, we've seen the, the, the Reserve Bank has been struggling um, to maintain their own words. I mean, they, they came up and said, um, we have um, an inflation targeting between three and 6%, and surely um, the economics of the day has proven that um, wrong because they have basically inflation is gone out of that range and now they, they, they should be asking what kind of monetary um, policy regime should we be looking at um, going forward. And, and I think um, we've already had the sentiments from the Minister of Finance from, from a fiscal policy um, on point of view going forward. There are indications that there will be tax increases going forward. And if we are trying to build an economy, and tax increases in itself might not be a very, very bad thing, but the thing is where is the increase coming from? If you tax small businesses, then you are killing job creation because when we are, you, you can't solve one problem by causing another problem. So these are some of the things we, we need to start um, looking and, and questioning. <coughs> And sometimes, if, if you tax um, very big businesses, you are also um, destroying their, their, their capability to, to expand the, the economy. And uh, I think from 94, the economy, in my view, started for on a very, very great um, food path. We started growing, if you look at various indices, economic freedom of the world index, um, doing business index, all this, we, we, were, we were rising on these indices. and. Somewhere five years or more down the line from 2005 and so, um, we've seen ourselves going down. Economic freedom of the world, we've gone down. Various indices, we're going down. And we should be asking ourselves, what, what are we missing? We were on a path to growth and development. We were on a path advancing. But suddenly, we've like taken a detour and we're going backwards, and I think if we have to create jobs for our children, if we have to create jobs for the next generation, if we have to absorb these youth that are coming out of varsity, we advertised a position uh, a few days. I'm not in HR, but I was amazed. I, I, I was just thinking of how HR people deal with these things of applications, because the, these things are real. It's affecting the youth drive through Alex, drive through any of the townships, early morning, and people are just moving around. These are young people. They should be in, in, in their jobs. So I think there, there are certain policies, like I said, an inclusive economy won't, it's not a matter of destiny for any country in the world. It's a matter of choice, and we need to start making the right policy choices. We need to start making the right um, business creation policies that would create entrepreneurship, because this whole culture of, I think, um, when the legislation with the 1994 negotiations 
buried apartheid from a policy point of view. There is still the apartheid of the mind. We need to transform mindsets if we have to move forward. We need to transform our people, whether they be politicians, to know that this is a new South Africa. And what that means is that we each have a role to play, to take forward the agenda of transformation, the agenda of an inclusive economy, the agenda of leaving behind a legacy that says, this is a country where people <coughs> used to work for themselves. I mean, before colonization, if you read African histories, people were not just idling around and waiting for government grants. There were no grants in the olden days. People worked hard. People had their own vegetable gardens. And how did it happen that today in 2014, we have 16 million South Africans directly dependent on government grants? Surely, in a country where we have less than um, 6 million um, direct <coughs> individual taxpayers. That is not acceptable. And we create the, the whole concept of Ubuntu, the whole concept of people realizing their full potential. Because I think what we are discussing today is not about having an equitable or an equal society. We are talking about because there's nothing like equality. People can only aspire to be the best they can be. Some people aspire to be politicians. Others aspire to be engineers. And based on the skills they have, all we want to create is an environment where people can be what they want to be because everyone cannot be the same thing. But I, I think that it is very, it, it would be a very, very shameful thing for the African continent that in 94 the hopes of Africa were raised to the fact that one of the greatest um, human evils of our time had been killed through this new transition and 20 years down the line, the aspirations of many are still not yet met. I, I think there is hope down the line. There are, there are lots of positives in, in the NDP, I, I, I said in one of the TV interviews recently. It's time to implement. We're not short of policy. It's time to sit around and really do the work. It's time to really, really create the, the right environment and, and start acting because we, we can't keep having talk shop and writing from one policy to another for the rest of time. I, I don't know how much time people would be patient, young South Africans in, in particular, to wait for the government to keep um, discussing because we don't want to have a situation of some social uprising. I mean, we've had in recent history the, the, the highest number of public demonstrations. People are not happy. And I think that if we start speaking together, the future is bright. We have resources. South Africa is one of the greatest um, resource-rich countries in, in, in the world. And there is human capital. There is a lot of bright minds. If you look at university graduates, I mean, between 94 and now, black South Africans. So we can't say we are short of engineers. We can't say we are short of, of people in various skills because they are coming over, they are, they are coming out of the systems. What we need to do is to create the right environments to absorb these people and, and transform. It would take time, but it is possible and we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Okay. Raising the youth question there. Salim, your Rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a rebuttal, but I'll, uh, <coughs> I thought I'll raise about uh, five uh, points. Uh, partly it will also be a response to some of the issues being raised. Um, it, it might seem odd that I deal with economic issues, but a lot of our work actually um, in, in environmental organization is really focused on uh, stand, uh, in a sense, transitions from resource-dependent uh, economies to, to uh, other types of more inclusive economies. But I think the, it's, it is fair to say that <coughs> it is not possible to create any kind of uh, center that uh, Trudy talked about um, in South Africa uh, if you don't have uh, some sort of trust uh, between labor, capital, uh, and, and the government. We don't have that at the moment. So it's actually uh, post Marikana, you can see that uh, despite the travesty of the, of the incident, uh, a lot of other things have been unleashed uh, that were bottled up uh, for the last 20 years. And the one of the key things that I think we have to get right before we even talk about any new policies or how we grow the economy, we really have to fix uh, the trust deficit 
uh, that exist. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, political sovereignty uh, for any country, any nation, has to go hand in hand with economic sovereignty. Uh, it can't be just good f to have a good political uh, climate of democracy with only a few people benefiting uh, from that. And sovereignty is also about the relationship between foreign capital and domestic capital, state, labor, etc. So you can't ignore that because we are part of a global uh, community. And part of the distrust is not just about uh, uh, relationships between labor and government, but complete uh, breakdown of, of any form of, uh, I think, long-term uh, presence of relationship between both foreign domestic capital, etc. So I think this is one area I would say that uh, you really have to fix uh, in order to be able to do anything uh, going forward. Uh, NEDLAC is out of the picture. I don't think NEDLAC is any more a forum that it used to, to serve. Uh, if, it, if it were to be revived, uh, I would think that you probably have to look at some other uh, structure to do that. We also don't need Indabas. I mean, I think <coughs> what we do need is, in my frank view, is that you need labor, government, uh, private sector uh, to really set over the next three years in a kind of uh, set of negotiations around important economic policies and the future of the country. Uh, if that's not uh, in the setting uh, in the next uh, two, three years, uh, the trend for South Africa is not going to be, be very good. So I think that's one of the things that I thought uh, I would like to say, and, and we, we really need to try to find uh, ways to fix that. <coughs> for me, a center is really about the ambit of relationships between labor, private sector, and capital. Uh, it includes even uh, options of state capitalism, because uh, in, in many, we can't ignore the importance of, of uh, state cap capitalism in other countries, and, and some of the successes that it's actually initiated and unleashed. So we can't say that all the solutions uh, for the delivery of, of uh, goods and services in the country only lies with the private sector, which I know Anne Bernstein is going to talk yeah, about. Uh, I, I have to start a debate, Anne, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think w th we have to recognize that the, the, in order to build an inclusive economy, we have to talk about uh, the nature of ownership, we have to talk about what's the right tax regime, we have to talk about minimum wage, because it's very important, I want to come to that uh, later, uh, share a different perspective of why uh, we shouldn't be so hardball about not having minimum wage uh, because uh, there are benefits to having minimum wage. Uh, <coughs> and of course we have to have uh, competition laws. Trudy has pointed out because we do have problems around dominance. There are four big banks in this country. Pricing is an issue. Uh, market advantage is an issue. Collusion is an issue as we've seen. Uh, and that is a sort of indirect tax to consumers uh, to uh, the development uh, possibilities of the country, uh, etc. So you can't ignore that and say that these, uh, uh, like some commentators in the business, they have, have been putting out that competition uh, law in South Africa uh, has been problematic and even misquoting Taroli and, and his views on that. Um, I think everybody knows who I'm talking about. Um <coughs> so I think th the discussion uh, in this kind of forum where you, you're bringing the parties together is to talk about a reasonable role uh, uh, between private and, and public sector, between foreign capital uh, and domestic capital. Uh, thirdly, I think uh, in the long term, uh, most people I would in this room would probably agree that you cannot have predatory uh, forms of capital. You can't have vulture capital. You've got to have some sense of uh, capital, uh, uh, especially from the investment and finance point of view, that is not short-term short -term in nature, that is driven about a long-term vision, and is embedded in strengthening not only, uh, uh, only the interests of shareholders, but both the political uh, sovereignty of the country and economic sovereignty of a country. And I have to put my, my flag on the, uh, 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 yeah, master, uh, put it uh, in the ground here. I'm an economic nationalist. I believe in the importance of 
the relationship between political and economic sovereignty. And we've seen that uh, happen, uh, uh, whether you like it or not, post-1948, the importance of, of uh, uh, those, because we've seen the benefits of having actually a nationalist governor. Of course, they've gone wrong on many other things. Uh, in the long term, you can't just limit the, the debate about the economic progress, just about inflation targeting and what the views of the credit uh, agencies are. We have to look at meaningful ways in which we can create long-term investment uh, in the real economy. And I, I will talk about that later, maybe uh, during uh, 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 question and answer. But let me go to that fourth point, which is really about uh, how do we grow the South African economy? The primary sectors played a, a big and important role uh, in South Africa. We talk about agriculture, mining. There was one point where mining in the 1970s was close to 20, 30 percent uh, of the South African economy. It had one million direct jobs. That's just direct jobs. Presently, it's around five to six percent, uh, and uh, the job numbers hover between 400, 500 uh, thousand. Most of the increase is attributed to manganese, platinum, and and, and coal. Um, the primary sector is still important, and I think uh, the NDB talks about uh, a possibility of actually being able to grow uh, jobs in that. But we have to recognize in the long term also uh, there are going to be challenges in the primary sector because there's a lot of mechanization and other kinds of efficiencies being introduced uh, both in the mining and agricultural sector. Currently, services uh, contribute 65% of the South African GDP, and they are mostly in finance, they are mostly in retail. They're mostly around uh, uh, in, uh, security, etc. They are not really around tradable services, which is really where some of the debate should be going. Uh, for instance, if you look at the services sector in developed economies, like the US, for instance, despite the fact that they offshore a lot of their manufacturing to China and so on, if you were to unpack the services sector, especially in the areas of business development and, and so on, you find that a lot of it is actually related to manufacturing, uh, design, engineering, etc. And uh, the, we can draw on both the primary and uh, 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 both agricultural and mining sectors to develop some of those uh, uh, services because they are, they are knowledge intense uh, and they require the trade of knowledge uh, in other countries, and, and particularly in Africa where 30% of uh, our trade now, uh, is, is, is we're we about uh, close to 30% of trade into Africa. We, we're busy uh, uh, reducing our dependence on Europe and North America. And we, we're strongly focusing uh, in, in China and so on. Uh, but linked to growth, you can't also not have a, just a debate about 5%, 6% growth. You have to talk about um, issues around savings. So South Africa's saving is, is astronomically low. Okay, I shouldn't say astronomically, but putantly low. It's not good English. That. Um, <coughs> we have to talk about uh, redistribution. Now, just recently, uh, you know, people will talk about the uh, grant system, but actually the, the World Bank just released a report, it was in the business day the other day, where to an extent the grants have actually helped with a great extent with, with redistribution. But everybody recognizes that it's going to be in the long term, it's not going to be in South Africa's interest, interest to continue with that. Of course, we have to find ways to create more jobs. We have to find ways to, uh, to ensure that uh, through uh, broader sharing and, and, and a creating inclusive economy, that with greater I employment, the redistribution effects are, are not just solely through grants, but actually through, uh, through job creation. Uh, and part of that discussion has to be around uh, creating jobs in the manufacturing sector, improving it in agriculture, uh, mining, and also looking at in the long term, because in the short term I don't think it's going to be possible to build knowledge intensive services sector because it's very isolated in South Africa, uh, but because you re require very highly, uh, uh, you have to develop your human capital to be able to, to do that. You can certainly improve uh, a great deal uh, the role of, of, of that uh, uh, in the economy. I think that one thing that I want to say is that ownership is important, but it, we shouldn't get a fetish about uh, ownership because assets in themselves are insufficient in today's world with the way in which uh, finance capital dominates uh, 
uh, economies and so on. But we should rather focus on how we can use uh, uh, natural assets, human capital and so on in better ways th uh, through improvements in no knowledge and integration of that knowledge in, in, in creating new kinds of, of services. Uh, there's an economist called Paul Romer who focuses a lot on the productivity question of how economies have grown and what is the contributing factor to productivity. So it's not just about adding more forklifts, more cranes and so on, more concrete. It's about actually how you better e have better uses for, for, for physical and other infrastructure uh, through the use of knowledge and other uh, uh, forms of creativity. And that's really what uh, 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 you find that as economies develop, especially in, in Scandinavia and so on, that's where uh, a lot of the focus is. I want to talk, come back to the last point, which is really about minimum wage. And I have to uh, say here that there, there's another way of looking at minimum wage. Um, improvements in income of people uh, means that they will spend more money in the, in the economy. That in itself uh, will grow uh, through that spending, through that consumptive spend, will grow uh, a demand. Okay, so we mustn't lose sight of that. Minimum wage is not a zero-sum zero game. Okay? Minimum wage also provides for actually improvement in productivity. There's a lot of studies that I can refer to later on to, to, to argue this case. Uh, it's not just that, uh, sure, I will ra wrap up. Because the important thing that people miss here is that productivity is a, a complex, or not just labor, but it's also management is involved in the way productivity works, and also capital investment, machines, and so on. And all of that contributes to, to productivity, knowledge as well. These are what uh, economists call endogenous factors. So the important thing here is to recognize that if the benefits of productivity are not equally shared, then <laughs> people are not, if the, if the appropriation of those benefits are to people who, uh, in a way, what we've seen, uh, this gap between the lowest paid workers and uh, the highest paid people, it will create a disincentive for people to, to perform and to continue to contribute uh, to the firm and, and in turn uh, to, to those productivities uh, levels that we, we are all talking about. So I want to leave it at that. I just I thought, uh, let me just introduce that into the debate. Thanks very much. I think <coughs> the, the issue around the benefits of productivity is key. Um, I'd like, I now like to hand over to oh. Anne Bernstein, who I'm giving the last word on the panel today. Great. Well, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be on this platform today um, and engage with uh, both the assumptions about what I think as well as the facts <laughs> of what I think, um, I what and with my <laughs> colleagues here. So, let me start with some key big issues, and then I'm sure we're going to come back to some of the detail in the question and answer section. Um, my organization has recently completed a key part of a very big project, which we called the Democratic Alternative from the South, India, Brazil, and South Africa. And the key question is this. There are many people, the Chinese and others, among them running around Africa and the rest of the world saying that, you know, developing countries, democracy is not such a good idea. You need to sort of give up on this human rights stuff and then you can grow and then you can return to human rights. Mm -hmm. And this is a view with which I am strongly opposed. I am a Democrat and it seemed to me that with all the attention to the phenomenal achievements of China, which have been remarkable, that it would be worth looking at the democratic countries in the South and to see how they were doing. How was democracy and inclusive growth faring in these countries? So we chose three countries, not for any special reasons. We had limited resources. Now, these are three very different countries with very different histories, and yet, they are remarkably similar in the challenges that they face. So these are three countries that punch way above their weight. They are very important in their regions and globally. What we find very quickly, um, the three countries have followed a remarkably similar trajectory over the last 25, 30 years, I'm generalizing. 
They all had an economic crisis some 25 years ago and responded, centre-left governments responded to this by introducing fiscal discipline and macroeconomic reforms. And these paid dividends. Slowly at first, but then in the buoyant global economy, they were much more open to the world than they'd been previously. They took off in different ways. India, sort of phenomenal growth rates. Brazil, pretty steady, about sort of higher than South Africa. And South Africa, for a period, didn't do badly at all. They all managed to lift millions of people out of poverty. Not a massive lift, but progress. So three decades of pro-poor policies in India didn't get very far, but when they turned to growth from, the 19, from 1990, they started to move around 200 people outside, away from absolute poverty. The Brazilian statistics are phenomenal and have a lot to do with urbanization, employment, and a number of other things rather than also familiar, which is a good policy, very tiny, much, much smaller than South Africa's grant scheme. And South Africa also in the last 20 years has managed through different mechanisms to improve many people's lives. Not as much as I would have hoped, but certainly improvements have been made. And the grant system has helped a lot of people uh, survive uh, better. Um, and the period in the 2000s was not jobless growth. Uh, but actually resulted in 2 million new jobs in a short period. All three countries are in the same crisis now. They thought that the new normal was high growth, and so in the 2000s they said, oh, enough with this pain of reform. Let's hand out more money in different ways. We, we can s start slipping on fiscal discipline, um, but we're going to grow. This is easy. Well, the world economy crashed, and life is not that easy. So in all three countries, they're in serious economic trouble. Uh, and obviously, I'm generalizing. And all three countries need to introduce a package of bold reforms. Um, they need to hold on to fiscal discipline and macroeconomic reform. They need to now introduce serious microeconomic reform, whether it's the flexibility of the labor market, I'm sure we'll debate that later, I'll come on to it in a moment. Exactly the same issues, really, in all three countries. Uh, Brazil has higher employment rates because in their Byzantine labor law system, it is easier than in India or South Africa for employers to fire people, and that makes them more amenable to hiring people. Um, other than that, all three have very complicated labor systems that are anti-employment sort of employment of people. They're all struggling to deliver infrastructure at the pace and the scale and the price that's necessary, partly because they, the state wants to do it all, very statist approaches, and they can't, and they're not adopting modern ways of bringing in the private sector to help with infrastructure. It's very clear across all three. All three countries have appalling education systems. Top 20, 30% do more or less okay in the public schools but and private schools, but for the vast majority of people, education is terrible. South Africa has replaced Brazil as one of the worst in the world. Brazil started to move in the right direction and improve the quality of education but this is from an extremely low base. India, unless you're in very sort of elite institutions, the education system is terrible uh, for very many people. This holds people back in all sorts of ways. There are a whole lot of things where they're very similar. They're also very similar in terms of, if you like, the quality of their states. Contrary to what my friends will think, uh, I am in favor of an effective state. I don't think you can operate in a modern economy unless you have a competent state. I want them to fix the potholes outside my street. I would like them to sort out electricity. 
But if you cannot do it, you need to bring in other players. And the state, if it is anti-business, is not going to deliver growth in the modern world. So I want an effective state. I want a state that is competent. But I also want a pro-market, not pro-business. I'm not in favor of crony capitalism. I'm in favor of competitive markets and the enterprises that perform within that. I want a state that understands that and plays to that. And then lastly, if you look at all three countries, they're all struggling with a very difficult issue, which my colleague here raised. It's the issue, whatever language you want to use, it's the issue of how do you bring those who are excluded from the modern economy into the economy, into the world of opportunity and decent education and hope for you and your children for a better life. All three countries have tried this and that. I think Brazil has done best, but they can't afford it now, and they're going to get some real problems. But there are big questions on the table. Uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm sure we can get into the details. But we really ended this big study by calling, in a sense, saying each country has to review the ways in which they are dealing with redress and inclusion of the poor. So this framework, this big global framework, influences how I see South Africa and the challenges that face us today. I am, and here we will clearly disagree, I am strongly opposed to people who go on and on about what we need is a deal between business, labor, and government. I am interested in the people who are left out of that deal. I'm interested in the unemployed. We have the highest recorded unemployment rate in the world of countries that record these things and where we believe the statistics. It's stunning. It is the biggest challenge facing us. The answer is not job creation. This is a misnomer. The answer is growth and the kind of growth that is labor intensive. Now here I will raise an issue everyone has ducked, and most people like to duck, and the NDP, which is a useful, I think Trudy said, first sort of beginning point, I agree with that. <coughs> South Africa has now experimented with what you could call the approach to growth, which is high wage, decent jobs, high skill. It's failed failed for the vast majority of people. South Africa needs an approach that is different. I agree with Gwedi Mantash who said decent jobs should be an aspiration. I am in favor of growth, of more firm development, a much better environment for business in which to take risks and expand their companies or grow their companies. I'm absolutely in favor of doing that in a competitive way, but I am also in favor of labor-intensive manufacturing. Some 86 million jobs are going to be leaving China in the next 10 years. No, these aren't the best jobs in the world, but you have to ask yourself, is it better for somebody to be unemployed or to have a job? I am unequivocally in favor of having a job and bringing the outsiders in the society into the modern world. You get a job in a factory with low, some basic conditions, but low wages, because that's all that can be afforded. That doesn't mean you're condemned to do that for the rest of your life. That is the approach that has been taken in Asia. And within one generation, Millions and millions of people now have better wages, better jobs, and much more opportunities for themselves and their children, particularly their girl children. So let me end then, before the chair lady attacks me, <laughs> and say that I think there's some important issues that have not been mentioned here. In my view, leadership matters. 
South Africa will not grow at the rates we need unless we have leadership. It's not only in government where it is singularly lacking, but it is also in the rest of society. We have to make choices. And you can't just say, let's keep doing what we've been doing for 20 years, because it's not working. You have to think globally, because we are an economy that <coughs> operates in a global world. And let me assure you, if the wage negotiations in the public sector are not handled carefully, we will see South Africa reach junk bond status. And that means, this isn't some game, this means that everything for everybody will get a lot more expensive. I think cities matter a great deal, and we don't talk about this in South Africa sufficiently. Rural romanticism still rules, and rural ambiguity still rules. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail, but if you want more opportunities, you have to deal with that. So I have a lot of other issues where we can argue, for instance, on skills, where we have to talk about trade unions, performance management, and we have to talk about South Africa's desperate need for foreign skills. We're desperately short of skilled people, and at a growth rate of 1.4%, which is what we're hoping for this year. We are desperately short of skilled people. Imagine what happens when we start growing at 3% or 4%, or hopefully 5 and 6%. We cannot do it with the skills we have we cannot train black South Africans with the skills we currently have. You need foreigners to do all sorts of things to help grow this country. Let me end there to say if you want to grow this economy, South Africa has to make some bold choices. We all have to move out of our labels and we have to, with great respect, I think people in the center of the road often get run over. You have to make some choices. And you have to talk about them. I don't think it's left, right, or whatever. I'm not interested in labels. I'm interested in how we deal with the country's biggest challenges of all, which is a much higher growth rate, which has to be labor intensive, which leads to employment, economic employment. And we have to fix the education system. That's it. Thanks, Anne, and for those interesting insights into the three countries that you, your organization looked into. As the host organization, I did commit myself to neutrality um, <laughs> at the onset of this event. I do have lots of questions and my own views, of course, but I won't be asking any questions myself this morning. So I'm going to leave it to the audience to put questions to our panel. I'm going to open the floor up. Please state your name and put your question forward. If you want to address it to a particular panelist, say so. Otherwise, you're welcome to ask an open question to the entire panel. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as usual, <coughs> I would like to thank uh, the South African Civil Society for holding these meetings. I would also like to thank the panel very much. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have questions. There are two things that I would like to say here. A doctor that treats symptoms of a disease and without establishing exactly what the disease is, is bound to fail. This is a very important subject. Um, this ex this, uh, this uh, exclusivity that we are talking about and the inequality that we are talking about did not really come yesterday. And my view here is that as long as we do not address the causes but just the effects, we are going to fail. I don't agree, for instance, that we can look at Germany as something to, to, to copy or to 
to gain something from them because inequality in this country was created by the Native Land Act of 1913. And I don't think we want to address that. In our constitution, um, section 25, paragraph 7, has simply entrenched the Native Land Act of 1913. So the inequality was there from day one because the Native Land Act of 1913 simply gave the majority of people of this country 7% of the land. Uh, now, how are we then going to fix all the problems when we left the land question, which is the basis of the economy at Codessa? I don't want to go into that because I think that it's a very emotional thing, at least for me. I don't think we're going to get anywhere until we resolve the land question. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Pio Shakam and I work in CORE. I wanted to ask Anne a few questions. First, uh, surely when you talk about leadership, you mean ethical leadership and not just any other kind of leadership because you could also have a dictator's leadership, uh, a la what we've seen in other parts of Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Uh, secondly, we have a trivialization of governance, both in state-owned enterprises and now creepingly into the private sector as well. So we have a Gordon who wants to fire his financial officer and creates a crisis in a huge plant uh, simply because he wants a bigger office than his financial <laughs> officer. I mean, you know, that's an absurdity. And now we have a shareholders meeting to decide on the matter because one part of a shareholding group decides that they need to support the CEO. So this series of fights between CEOs, boards, board chairs, and the lack of an ethical governance in South Africa is also an issue that we need to consider because we're losing jobs like in telecom, the post office, and so on. And surely, one of these fine days, DHL are going to come in here and offer Pretoria an opportunity to take over all our post offices because they probably want to do a more efficient job than the current post office structure. But added to that, I think, is also the, the parlor state of our universities and FET colleges. Max and Adam now want to reintroduce racism into our universities by saying they will have a racial quota as to how many people get into medical school. We don't hear a civil society or business group saying that this is anathema to them because this goes back to what the Universities Act was all about back in 1955 to separate out black students against white students. And surely if we want to develop an integrated society, we need to ensure that the best candidates go to university. And business does not say anything about that. Uh, my last point is about the national minimum wage. I think that we do need one, primarily because we're sitting in a situation where we cannot afford uh, social grants any longer. And I think that's an open fact. So if we want to ease off the population of social grants, we need to have a mechanism where national minimum wages would be provided for. And whilst business acts all very coy about creating jobs and so on, RMB, for example, are sitting on 17.5 billion rands in retained income. Truworths is sitting on something like 12.5 billion rands as well. Retained income on their balance sheets, which is sitting in the banks, which is not being utilized either in this country or outside of this country in creating jobs in other parts of Africa. So businesses is a very serious responsibility to face up to. Thank you. So um, uh, Dr. Peku um, didn't have a question, but did raise a very important issue, which is land dispossession. I mean, clearly it has had an impact on people's material conditions. We haven't resolved that problem still in South Africa. We've written a great deal about the land issue in South Africa and I think it's 
an issue that the government doesn't know how to deal with and they flail around and we're not making progress. This is not good for South Africa. The agricultural sector is now about 2.5% of the national economy directly. Land is no longer the most important factor of production. This is the 21st century. We are not seeing a massive push of people to the agricultural colleges. So it's not like there's an enormous demand. Yes, there are some people who want land. But you know, if somebody, if my, somebody came to you and said, I'm a young person, tell me the way to make my future in the 21st century, I wouldn't say, gee, you must get a piece of land far from markets and you're going to need tons of capital. We know agriculture is a high intensive, high skill intensive, highly competitive, high risk enterprise and it's global. Now I'm in favor of black commercial farmers. We need them. We need more of them. There's some, they're not enough. Agreed. This is not the most important issue facing South Africa. Should we resolve it? Absolutely. But there are bigger issues. South Africa is over 60% urbanized now. Let's talk about urban land. Let's talk about urban jobs. Much more important issue. And I want to just ask you a question sure. uh, around the land question, and that is around, for a lot of people in this country, the land restitution is a symbolic issue. Sure and that's linked to the dispossession. And we can't always just um, approach it with a right. cold economic mm. point of view. So, I mean, how do you respond to that? Okay. Look, let me say, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this lately. There is discrimination happened in this country and it was terrible. And it has consequences to, to this day. And, you know, let me give you an example. Uh, the chairman of First Rant, who is my chairman of my board, says, you know, when we started the First Rant company, now one of the biggest banks in, in South Africa, a multi-billion rand enterprise, three of us started it and we had 30,000 rand. And I said, how did you get that money? Well, he jokes, I mortgaged my wife. He says, my mother mortgaged, gave me some money. Each one of us, our mothers could give us money. Now, black South Africans, their mothers and fathers can't do that for them because of our history. Absolutely. This is a fact. The much more important question is, and it's tough, it's what do you do about it? And it's the same with land. We can have a discussion, yes, there are political issues and emotional issues about land. I understand that. But in part, and South Africa's done very well, actually. The South African government, if you look at the three components of land reform, they have done pretty well in some aspects of this. In terms of restitution, they've done well, till this crazy decision to open it up again. They, they've dealt with something like 95% of the cases, the vast majority with some money. You claim some land because your family was dispossessed, they have dealt with us sometimes with land, but mainly with money. And they've done well. What was remaining were these very big, very complicated rural cases, where it wasn't Siraj and I claiming a piece of rural land. It was an entire clan of 300, 400 people, because it's grown, saying, we want that land back. This has been hard for the government to deal with, partly because it's very difficult to do, Secondly, they haven't had competence in that department. So the kind of people in that department have generally not understood agriculture. So we've been giving back land to large groups of people in a communal form, taking away private ownership and re-communalizing commercial land. And the government itself has said that over 90% of those projects have failed. This is a very difficult thing to do in any country. We've not done it well here. Now, is this fair? No, the world isn't fair. But I think you've got to say, how do we move forward as a country? And what I think Nelson Mandela got so right was that it wasn't so much one of, let's look at what went wrong in South Africa. And things were terrible. 
but let's look at how we build a future for all of us. So I am in favor of building a future. If for the last 20 years this, the government, had made sure we had decent education for everybody, not just the 20%. 80% of the government schools are dysfunctional, according to them. Now, if we had got that right, we would be in a very different situation. I so I think we've got to acknowledge some of these issues. They're true. The, the tough choice is how you move forward in a constructive way. And then, of course, Peter shows um, uh, the issues that he raised uh, around minimum wage um, and certainly what's happening with the profits that big corporations are sitting with. Um, it certainly, as he said, does not seem to be reinvested in productive sectors of the economy. Trudy. Okay. Um, I think there was an interesting comment coming from um, a gentleman at the back um, saying about how corporate governance failures are now creeping into the private sector. And I thought it was very interesting because it's seen almost as a new thing um, that now you're seeing these meltdowns. Coming from a competition um, commission <laughs> environment, you know, one of the things you do is read truckloads of um, internal minutes of companies, board meetings, and kind of just how they think about issues. And that for me has, all, I always thought, I think they're giving us the wrong documents, or I think they're not giving us everything. But I think reading the news now, I think actually, no, it, it was pretty, a pretty fair um, snapshot of what goes on. Because I don't think we should be completely, um, obviously, exaggerate um, the scale of the problem. But we do have many companies that have a very casual relationship with things like King 3, um, the laws of the country, um, just kind of um, good corporate citizenship. And it, it's not a blame game. I think it's just a reality that perhaps instead of saying business that, government that, labor that, at the end of it all, we just have to acknowledge that we have a problematic society. Um, what, what the, you know, there's something wrong with us, all of us. It's not that there's one segment um, that's much worse or, or, or that's um, deteriorating. Um, so then how do we move forward? How do we build a future? I think that this is a very important question. And we've talked about issues around mindset, um, around um, government policy, the right policy mix. But on some level, I almost don't care who does it. And different countries have come up with different solutions, be it state capitalism in East Asia or uh, very, much, very aggressive um, capitalism in early American history. It, it seems to me that it's just a mix of incentives and accountability. Um, getting a system that works for your context, giving the right incentives, but also ensuring that abuses, exploitation doesn't occur, and, and, and having a, a system that works and provides the right outcomes um, in, in that context. So I, I don't think we should get caught up um, in terms of who intervenes, where, or how. I think it's more if they're intervening, are they doing it the right way? East Asian state capitalism, massive intervention. Why did it work? There was discipline that was enforced, A, by the political economy, but I would say more importantly by the fact that they, they were addressing mainly export markets. So if their policies were failing, they would immediately see that they're exporting less, earning less foreign exchange, um, creating fewer manufacturing jobs, and it would be an immediate signal. It didn't matter who was doing it. It's more that there was a good feedback mechanism and, and there were consequences um, towards failure. The question of retained earnings is an interesting one because I've also tried to almost do a thought experiment to say, well, if I was these companies, what would I do with that money? And it is a very tough question. I think it's been raised that it's a risk return um, calculation that's very difficult to do in South Africa in the current climate in terms of... Tree, you know, both yeah. for you yeah. and for Anne, I mean, the, there is this question of dealing with risk. Um, but, you know, there's also an issue around blatant corruption in terms of the way people deal with money when they have it. I mean, I've been listening to you guys speak today, but thinking about the story that's in the news about Lonman and Marikana, and the fact that they were given a huge amount of money from the World Bank alone to build 5,000 houses, and they built three houses. Um, for the workers. You know, um, it doesn't tally up always with this argument that it's, it's, it's always risk that drives um, 
the way companies make decisions? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to the point I just made now about accountability and incentives. So, the, you know, the mining charts, I suppose, is a classic example of that because I think the mining industry was not opposed to the mining charts. I could see why it was important, transformative, agreed to the commitments around social housing, social development, ownership, um, et cetera. But was there a proper enforcement mechanism for that? And I mean, I'm not just talking about enforcement of the, whether the company's doing it, but also how is the community, say in community um, projects, how are those being implemented? And I think that there became almost a parasitic relationship, which is corrupt, where things were simply not getting done and, and until it got to breaking point. And it became very obvious that, yes, I don't know about the figures, but very few houses have been built, et cetera, et cetera. Three out of 5,000. Three out of 5,000 um, is, is the figure you're given. So I think, but that, I mean, how does that happen? You know, if you've got an effective government system, is the shareholder not saying, how are we doing mm. on that social labor plan? Is the social labor plan manager, why are they being, you know, remunerated? What's the community saying? Um, it goes back to, I think, part of the, the collusion point I made earlier. You know, when we had hearings at the competition tribunal, the tribunal was very active in asking each of the directors, board members that came, how did this happen under your watch? How did you not know? How did the auditors not pick it up? No one could really explain. They all knew that, no, they didn't know about it. But <laughs> how? <laughs> how they didn't know about it <laughs> was just a, a clear indictment that perhaps all our institutions, corporate governance, public accountability, are dysfunctional um, in, in, in that way. We are dysfunctional. Um, I think the last point I wanted to raise was just about a different aspect of risk um, in terms of the way South African society thinks about risks um, in terms of entrepreneurship and starting up businesses. And then that's another mindset issue that um, is problematic. People say I'm being soft and whatever when I say there is a mindset aspect to entrepreneurship and that there is that psychological barrier that we do have in terms of either stepping forward or um, failing and picking ourselves up. But I think that there's something to be said that we have a challenge there. But I also think society's institutions, like the tax regime, welfare system even, doesn't necessarily support um, risk taking at that level. So if you think about your pension, your medical aid, et cetera, uh, even bankruptcy, I don't think we think about it in a way that supports high potential people who can fail but can try again over and over again, um, especially if they don't have um, family resources, you know, in, in the example um, that you gave. That was going to be my last point, but I realized I didn't talk to Dr. Peku's point about the land question. I mean, I do think, yeah, is it fair to say it's not being addressed? I'm not sure about it. I think there has been a, a mechanism put forward. I do think implementation has been lacking. Um, in terms of even in restitution, I think some things are thought about the wrong way. So for instance, even where there's been financial compensation, you know, there was a recent constitutional court case that really made me pause about how we think about um, compensating. This was an urban land case, um, the Florence case, if anyone knows about it. And the family had lost um, a property in, in a suburb which is now extremely um, wealthy, etc., and they can't get the property back. And there was a sense that the courts were willing to give market-related compensation when land is being taken away, but not market-related compensation when someone is being given financial compensation. And I think those sorts of issues um, betray that we haven't really thought about this deeply. It would be hugely expensive um, to pay someone who's lost uh, property in Rwanda Bosch the market value today. But I think there should be a principle to say, if we're not doing market-related compensation, we're not doing it on both sides, and this is what um, the, the regime that we have, rather than having this inequality between those who are being compensated and those uh, who are being expropriated, or also inequality between those who gain their property back and those who only gain financial compensation. And I think those kinds of little, I mean, they seem like technical things, mm -hmm. but I think they betray a, a bit about how much land has been off the radar um, for too long. Jim Powell, Direct Democracy South Africa. And my question here is, uh, if you take a look at the example of Hong Kong, in the 60s, the average um, income was 25% that of uh, the income within England. 
and I believe now currently it's getting close to 140 percent. It's a very simple thing. Government stepped away, said get on with it. Okay. Well, um, one minute only for Salim, and I'm closing the discussion for today. He's responding to Hong Kong. I mean, I think the, <coughs> the thing that I'm, I'm very careful about is um, this idea that there's uh, only one recipe for, no, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm responding to his question, Sorry, not to you. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I'm also qualified, with it, so just give me one minute. Um, I think that uh, it has to be driven by context. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to say that in certain conditions, um, uh, the markets probably won't be able to deliver all the goods and services. So, so one has to look at what is the meaningful role for the state uh, in that. Um, of course, with the proviso that uh, if there are mechanisms of delivery that um, is uh, part of the state apparatus, that they actually perform and they actually do uh, deliver the goods and services that are required. For instance, there's a big debate in economics about whether in certain types of basic needs, like in water, uh, electricity, whether it is best to do that in the early phase of economic growth uh, to be uh, dominated by the state, or should it be uh, uh, deregulated to such an extent that it's uh, given to the market, and what would be the consequences of doing it. So there are, so I would say one has to look at this very carefully as to what uh, a particular context of a country is, and what is the right role for state and market in that. Uh, I, I'm just very averse to the sort of knee-jerk rhetorical comments, uh, you know, that state will solve everything or the market will solve everything. I think we have to accept that we have a mixed economy in South Africa. I want to come back to the main point that I made earlier in, in, in the talk, that going forward, really going forward, you have to have the right political economy. And that means the dominant uh, forces uh, that operate in that economy have to agree with each other before uh, you can really do something meaningful uh, going forward. Thank you very much.